Welcome to 30 Minutes of Faith. We're here today with Ramona Goodge, who is a ministerial student for the Center for Spiritual Awareness and one who serves in the interfaith community. Welcome. Thank you, John. Nice to have you here. Thanks. Can we start, please, with background on where you were born and raised and grew up and those kinds of things? Certainly. I'm uh, proud to say that I'm a Buckeye from Ohio, and uh, I grew up uh, in a very small farming community, so I feel pretty comfortable right here in the Central Valley. I grew up in a um, fairly large family with uh, two older brothers and two older sisters, and um, was in a family that was um, grew up in a very fundamental church, um, Congregationalists, You know, the uh, uh, I always tease my mother that we came from a uh, the lineage of Puritans. You know the the uh, straight back pews and um, going to church all day Sunday and almost it felt like every day throughout the week so um, faith has always been a big part of my family and going to church has always been a big part of the family so um, it still is a big part of my entire family. Are your parents still living? No, both of my parents are gone and um, just recently I lost my mother in the last year and the church and that whole community, the communal um, aspect was a big support for my mother uh, during her final couple of uh, weeks and months and, and throughout her illness. And, um, and her faith was a big part of her as she went through her illness. And so I just see that as just being such a strong part of our being. Did you have a happy childhood? Oh, I did. I did. You know, growing up in the country, I can't see any other way of growing up. You know, I just, I mean, I, I had a great childhood. You know, I had my own horse. I had my own dog. You know, you know, growing up on a farm, I think, is a great way to grow up. You have responsibilities. It's hard work, but it's great fun, too. I was born in a town with 219 people, and I thought the whole world evolved around it. After my father died, we moved to the city, 4,000 people. That was real exciting. Are your brothers still an active part in your life? They are. I, um, you know, I have to go back to what you said. I graduated, my graduating class was 88 students. And now I talk to these people, you know, that they, you know, they have graduating classes of 400. And I'm thinking that was more than we had in our entire school system. Um, yes, my brothers are still... Uh, very much a part of my sisters as well uh, and m my nieces and nephews and as a matter of fact I have 18 great nieces and nephews and I keep telling them I'm too young to be a great aunt I just refuse that yeah I won't ask you to sing it but could you still sing your school song no <laughs> <laughs> But it goes to old Wisconsin. I know that's the I know that's the, the the music that goes behind it. How important is family to you personally? Family is very important. I think that family, uh, even though my family is all still back in Ohio, um, a couple of the nieces and nephews have moved away from the home area. Um, we're still a very close knit family, and we stay in contact with one another. And I think that family, that's your support system that you go back to when everything else kind of starts to crumble away. Th thank goodness for email and digital. Uh, and Facebook. And Facebook. Yeah, the nieces and nephews have taken me clawing to Facebook. You know, I didn't want to get on it, you know. But the, the nieces and nephews were like, if you want to see pictures of the great nieces and nephews, you got to join up with Facebook. What brought you to Sacramento? Well, I came to California after I graduated from college um, because of college friends to see the great west, you know. Um, and then eventually I just kept moving north, 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 and, uh, and it was work that brought me to, uh, to Sacramento. I work for uh, a company that does uh, travel, and I take older clients out on trips to tours to Western National Parks. My specialty is Western National Parks and Agriculture. 
so I teach natural history and agriculture all over the western United States. And so it was through that work that brought me to Sacramento. Until I went to boot camp, I had never been out of the Rocky Mountain area other than a vacation or two at the ocean. But I had no idea what the Midwest was or the East or the, you know, the Eastern Seaboard. And um, we have a great variety in America. And that is true with religions, is it not? Uh, absolutely. When I was in college, I went to college to be a teacher. And there, my, it was my intention at the time, I went to school to be an English teacher. And it was my intention at the time to follow up with a master's degree in comparative religion. Because I was so fascinated in my studies in English, I was so fascinated with looking at how there were similar creation stories. And I was just looking at the similarities in the creation stories that followed through literature. And I thought, if we could have all those same creation stories in all these different cultures, because my minor was in social geography, and I looked at those threads, and I thought, I need to get a master's in comparative religion. And so it's taken me, well, we won't say how many years, but a lot of years, over 30 years, to now where I'm starting to get my master's now in, in uh, ministerial, I'm going to ministerial school now, and I'm getting my master's degree through uh, the religious science, which allows me to study all those different faiths. And to look at these, and being involved in the interfaith community, allows me to go back to what I was originally interested in, is all that, that common thread that runs through all the faiths. And I'm just fascinated by that. How did you come specifically to the interfaith council, interfaith gatherings and setups? It's that interest that really underneath all of the dogmas of all the religions that we're all one. It's a common theme. We hear it over and over. It is. You know, we all are one. We all have the same heartbeat that flows through all of us. We all have the same love. We all have the same basis that we're operating from, which is love. Do you think religion is on the decline? I don't think that religion is on the decline. I think that the way that religion looks is that religion looks much different. We've talked before that, um, for instance, in college, the you know in the '60s, the big theme was God is dead, and you'd see. Uh, billboards would say, well, he's not really dead, he's just on vacation, or he's gone hiding in the universe somewhere. Mm -hmm. In the last generation, interfaith has really strengthened, per se, as interfaith. Mm -hmm. Everybody's interested in, we are the same, we are all children of God. But organized religions are losing their memberships. So how do you think things are going there? I think that people are still seeking to have that understanding. There, there's an inherent part of us that is seeking that connection with our own being, with, with our creator, with spirit, whatever name that you want to call it, spirit, creator, God. So that is very much alive within us. I think religion is looking much different. I think that we're finding religion as an organized being, as, as that organized church, it's looking much different. I think that we're finding people seeking to understand their connection with spirit in coffee shops, in homes, in one-to-one -one gatherings. So I think that it's very much alive that the seeking, the seeking to understand is very much alive. 
but and even churches are looking much different you know how church looked you know 50 40 years ago when when I went to church it looks much different today than what it looked like you know Bible studies are happening at 10 o'clock in the morning they're happening at 7 o'clock in the morning they don't happen at Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. Now, there might still be happening in that time, but they're happening at different hours because we're all working at different hours. And the churches that are evolving and working and, and doing things differently are the ones that are growing. The ones that are staying to the old and stayed ways are the ones that are having decreased membership. Then is spirituality increasing? I think so. It feels like it. It feels like it to me. I think it's very much alive and well in this country because there's always that seeking of, of wanting to know. How did you come to the Center for Spiritual Awareness? It was my own seeking and wanting to know. And it felt right because it, the Center for Spiritual Awareness believes that love is the guiding power. That love, that God is love, and that is the message at the Center for Spiritual Awareness. Can you teach us a little bit about what that center is doing in Sacramento and background and history? Yes, the Center for Spiritual Awareness is based over in West Sacramento, and it um, is affiliated with a greater association. It's called the United Centers for Spiritual Living, which is an international organization. The Center for Spiritual Awareness um, is very much involved with the homeless um, programs, uh, especially in West Sacramento, and also with children. That are the, their two main focuses, and working with the teenagers over there and, and young children. And so those are our two largest programs that we have there. But the basis for everything is everything. Every action is either a call for love or a, an expression of love. Is spirituality always a personal thing? Can it be tag-teamed? Is it in the family, in the workplace? Where, where do we find spirituality? Is it always just a personal search? You're just looking, just you? Hmm. I believe that spirituality is a personal thing. It's, it's my relationship with, with spirit. But I believe that spirituality can be infused in everything that we do. I think that spirituality... That's, that's a nice way to say that. It can be infused in everything that we can do. Spirituality is something that can be brought in to, into the workplace. It can be in the classroom. Because spirituality can be brought in to, for example, as I work with people, you know, I bring in readings from John Muir or I bring in readings from, bring in poetry that, that touches that place within us that makes us appreciate beauty, makes us appreciate joy, makes us go just a little bit deeper into our heart and drop that 18 inches from our head into our heart. And when we do that, then we drop into our place where we are in alignment with spirit. Do you talk religion and or spirituality in your travel business? I do not talk about religion. I avoid three topics, religion, politics, and sex. <laughs> but I will talk about touching that place within my heart where I know that I am one with something greater than myself. And people resonate with that. People will respond when I talk about looking at the beauty of creation and knowing that there is something greater. When I talk about that I look at the magnificence of the mountains or I look at the, the beauty of a tree and how magnificent it is how a tree 
functions, how a tree works. Or how talk about how trees are in community with one another. And the, the roots of a tree intertwine. It's the only way that a sequoia tree can, can stand because its roots are only four feet deep. Yet this tree is 250 feet tall that it has to intertwine its roots with the other trees around it. And so that tree stands in community and works in community with the other trees because it is intertwined and enmeshed with one another and it depends on the other trees. And I talk about that being in community. They understand that. And that touches their heart. Have you ever been up to the Lady Bird Johnson Redwood Grove yes. up the coast? The first time I went there, that was a spiritual experience for me. They were, they were bigger and stronger and more majestic than all of the other great big ones that were all around them. And it, even the temperature was different yeah. in that grove. And that was a real spiritual experience. So would you say that your clients and your customers are connecting with that awareness of what nature and what is all about us unfolds. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We can go out, you can go out, and, and I use nature so much as, as a teaching tool, as, as a way of teaching that we are, we are just one with this and that you can step out. I mean, what better tool than, than looking at the ocean to understand infinity? Do you have a favorite national park? Oh, Sequoia is my favorite. Because what a cathedral. There is no cathedral grander than a cathedral of Sequoias. Yeah. Where do you rank Yosemite? It's up there, but it's not one of my favorites. There's too many people. But the waterfalls this year were wonderful. Oh, spectacular. Were you taught spirituality, that inner awareness as a child? I was. Were your parents spiritual? My parents were, my parents were more fundamentalists. But I had a neighbor lady. Her name was Lucille. And she was spiritual. She was a poet. And she was a spiritual lady. She was the one who would wander around outside in her bare feet and pick up rocks and leaves. And she was the one who really taught me to just be out and appreciate all of God's creation. Now that seeking can come in a lot of different ways. Some people will read the Bible or some other holy writ. Mm -hmm. Some people love the music. The music is a universal language that will touch the soul. Some pray, some meditate. Mm -hmm. Is there a part of that in spirituality that you find you're passionate about or that you really enjoy? For me, um, meditation is very much a part of my personal practice as well as being um, a walking meditation outside is very much a part of my personal practice. You know, being obviously I'm very passionate about nature. So that for me is a very nurturing to my soul. I got lost on the Lost Coast once. <laughs> you know where that's I at. I do. And it was getting dark and, you know, there were others with us, but we were turned around other than we knew the ocean was there and mm -hmm. the ocean wasn't there. And we decided we'd spend the night, we'd hunker down, find a place, and that by morning things would be better. And the nighttime sky and the surf just were magnificent. And morning brought a fresh day and a new start, and you know, away we went. Um, do you like the ocean preferably over mountains or not necessarily? I have to say it depends what mood I'm in. Fair enough. Yep, it depends. Sometimes I go to the ocean because that's, there's that sense of vastness. And that's that place of just infinity. And there, there in the ocean is that place where 
you, you know, you can just watch it. And it's like, you know infinity and you know there's that sense of eternal because it just continues and continues. And then you have the sunrise and you have the sunset and you have the promise of a new day. Hard to beat the beauty of the sun setting into the ocean. Absolutely. Now uh, you're talking about you're a student now working towards becoming a minister. Mm -hmm. What will you do once you're ordained? Well, that's kind of a joke among ministerial students because what I've learned so far, I'm, I'm two years into a, a, a four-year program, and what I've learned so far is that you start into the program thinking you know what you're going to do, and then God has other plans for you. So um, it is my intention at the moment um, to work with um, elders. That's, that's what I'm interested in doing. My, my passion is to continue working with elders and through hospice. And what I'm, what I kind of call elders, and I'm thinking about elders that are in assisted living and in convalescent homes in that realm, they're kind of our forgotten population and then moving on into the hospice care so folks that are in long-term long-term um, long-term illnesses um, or maybe not quite into long-term but those that are in assisted living um, they kind of go away and are forgotten and so those that's kind of the target population that I'm looking at working with. I've been in a choral group for a lot of years that sings in convalescent centers. We do an awful lot in the holidays and it's a joy to watch the elderly people yeah. sort of come to life. Will you stay in Northern California to do that? I believe so. That's my intention yep, to stay here. So are you stuck in California the rest of your days? No, I don't need to be. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have no reason, to, I have nothing keeping me here. So if I, if I end up somewhere else, that's fine as well. We've been in Sacramento for 30 years, and one of the things we've liked about it is it can be rural, or it can be the state capital, downtown, busy right. city at the same time. You can get to the ocean, you can get to the mountains. That's the beauty of it. It's a wonderful place. That's the beauty of it. How about your future in interfaith? Where will that lead you? That is a very major part of, of, of my future. That, that, that is one of the main reasons why I am involved with the United Centers for Spiritual Living. That w that's the, the, the international organization I'm with. They have a global heart vision, which is part of their main philosophy. And that global heart vision is to see a, is a better world for everyone. And the global heart vision is to see a better world from everyone, and it starts from the heart. And that is that, and their basic philosophy is that we all are one. And to create a better world starting from the heart. And that is inner faith. So that is that global heart vision is my vision. And so that is inner faith. The, the best example that I can give of that is the work that I have done with elders and, and in hospice. You know, the best example I can give is that I was at the bedside of a, of a, a man who was dying. And his, he was Lutheran and his wife was a beautiful Japanese lady who was Buddhist. And they, as, as, as he was dying, the children, his children were Lutheran and, his, and her children were Buddhist. And the children were having problems 
with the two religions. And I was able to go in there and facilitate and answer the questions for both of those families. And that was the beauty of going in there with an open heart and from a basis of the inner faith to, to bring those two families together who at that very moment were not looking at their father but were looking at the two religions. They were worried about where he was going to go because, you know, you know there was all this conflict up. And I was able to take that conflict and help that conflict dissolve and get them back to love. That's the beauty of inner faith. What do you think we should be doing in Sacramento specifically as an interfaith group? Focusing on this idea of going from love and going from the heart and going from oneness. If you could wave a magic wand in your life, what would you like to see go away? Borders and labels. Labels. We spend a lot of time labeling people and then have to work twice as hard to tear the label off. Mm -hmm. we're, we're anxious to help do that. And I, I think those that are sincere in the inner faith work don't want to see that you are, I am, they are. We just all want to be children of God. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's been a delight to visit with you and wish you well in your travels and in your continuing studies to become a minister. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, John.